Ward has been an occupational therapist for 28 years, most recently in an outpatient clinic with clients with progressive neuromuscular diseases and a wheelchair seating clinic. She's the adjunct professor at the OT assistant and master's OT programs at Cabarrus College of Health Sciences, in addition to working in the clinic full time. She is the author of num numerous articles and book chapters and is the co-author, co-editor of a book in its second edition entitled Adult Physical Conditions, Intervention Strategies for Occupational Therapy Assistance, as well as speaking and presenting locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. She has received the national honor of Roos roster of fellows and the Terry Britnell OT OTA partnership award through the American Occupational Therapy Association. Welcome Amber and take it away. I almost said rooster instead of roster. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. You can hear me okay? Yes I can. Perfect. All right. Let me are you sh I'm sharing the slides? Yes. Okay. Give me half a second. All right, can you see those? Yes, I can. Awesome, perfect, thank you. All right, everybody, good to meet you. I'm Amber Ward. I'm an occupational therapist in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have worked for about 18 years at the um, Carolinas Neuromuscular ALS MDA Center in Charlotte. We are now part of Atrium Health, um, or I guess have been, but Atrium Health uh, is the newer name. And so I wanted to do some talking today about the occupation of living. So a lot of people are quite confused about occupational therapy and what that is and what that looks like. So we're gonna do some talking about that and then how it relates to limb girdle. So about me a little bit, I just had my 28th uh, anniversary as an occupational therapist. My first day of work 28 years ago was on Memorial Day, if that tells you anything about being in healthcare. And so just past that milestone, I did grow up in Wisconsin and you can probably hear my accent from Wisconsin. I don't have kids, but I have lots of pets, birds and cats and dogs and fish and all the other things. Um, I've been about, as I mentioned, about 18 years um, at the MDA ALS clinic in Charlotte, and for about 17 <laughs> years, I've also done wheelchair seating um, and equipment, and I've also taught for 12 or 13 years as an adjunct professor, professor in an OT and OTA program. So lots of different kinds of experience. Honestly, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of folks over the years with Limb Girdle. And so I hope for my, I'm speaking from a place of, um, <laughs> I'm sorry? Sorry okay. about that. Uh -huh. All right, so our objectives today are to, that you will be able to verbalize the distinct role of the occupational therapist at an MDA clinic and that you will be able to, <laughs> so sorry for my phone going off, um, identify adaptive equipment and adaptive techniques you could use for daily tasks. All right, so those are our objectives. It's always something when you're in your home office, that is for sure. Um, so occupational therapy is about promoting well-being. So occupations in this aspect are literally everything a person does all day long to get through their day. And so if you're a baby, your occupations are sleep and play and eating. If you are an adult, those might look like work or school or childcare or getting dressed or wiping your bottom and all the other things that we do. So occupations in this case are literally our daily roles, routines, tasks, okay? And so there is um, a list here of some of the types of things that occupational therapists focus on. And so I think most people who have a sense of OT understand the activities of daily living part of it, the self-care. Um, but as we're looking about um, some of the other things, it could be what they call instrumental activities of daily living. And so that is the care of your home, 
your um, community, your children, your pets, um, cleaning, laundry, those sorts of things in your home. Health management is things like taking your pills and going to the doctor and, and doing those things in a timely fashion, remembering your appointments. Rest and sleep, of course, is incredibly important. Leisure and play all get rolled in there together. Education, work, and then just social interaction. How much time do we spend on the phone and the computer and talking with people in a book club and kind of all those other things. And so we are part of um, an allied health team typically at an MDA clinic. And so our partners are physical therapy and speech therapy and that kind of thing. Just a shift. So OTs talk a lot about occupational engagement. And so what that might mean for you is that what do you need and want to do? What are your own personal tasks and rules and responsibilities that you have to get through um, in your day, in your week, in your month, in your year? And with a progressive disorder, how can you keep doing those things? Like what does that participation look like as far as your everyday life and, and kind of understanding how to keep going with the things that you want to do and not have to give up anything that is important to you. You might do it in a slightly different way, but hopefully you're not doing, giving it up entirely. So we're going to do some talking about how to stay engaged as well. So specifically at an MDA clinic, you can see this list on the screen of things that an OT might do through the clinic. Typically, um, the occupational therapy is just sort of rolled into that visit. Most folks come and see us about every between six months and a year, depending on um, how things are going for that particular person. But there's, we can certainly do some evaluation if there's a new problem that's cropped up because of increased weakness or pain or stiffness or whatever. We can certainly consult um, many MDA clinics from, pull from a pretty wide catchment area. And so taking a look at um, can we find you perhaps home therapy in your own community? Can we find somebody to do a certain brace or a, a certain kind of equipment when you live four hours from the MDA clinic and then those sorts of referrals and recommendations. We do a lot of education, especially with occupational therapy. People are continually surprised that there is actually a solution that there, and believe me when I tell you, there is a solution for every single daily task you can possibly imagine. Now, just because there's a solution doesn't mean that solution works for every single person, but it's pretty hard to stump an OT. Um, and we, we have jokes about trying to stump the chump here in our, in our um, clinic. That's, that's pretty challenging after 18 years in, in that doing this particular job. And it really is about, um, as this quote says, where science, creativity, and compassion collide because one of my most favorite things to do is problem solving, adapting, coming up with gadgets and equipment and things like that. We, many MDA clinics are associated with a loner closet or understand the ones in the communities that might be available, maybe through churches or rehab centers or that kind of thing. And so can help people tap into loaner equipment. Maybe that's a loaner power chair or scooter or a loaner shower chair, things like that. It might be also helping people stay engaged if they have pain or stiffness or fatigue. And so it might be taking a hard look at those daily tasks and is there a way to adapt? Is there a way to do that more easily or spread things out in a different way? Is there a way to not get over fatigued? Many people have a good day followed by two bad days because they've just overdone it on the day when they feel pretty reasonable. And so helping to kind of keep that going. The other thing to consider is if you have weaker muscles and you have a stiff joint, it's going to be much harder to move through that joint than if you had a loose joint. Let's think about that for a second. If your joint moves freely and your muscles are weaker, at least you'll be able to do the best you can. 
but when you combine weak muscles and a very stiff joint, it just gives you even more problems. And so doing stretching and keeping things moving the best you can really makes a difference. I like this little adaptation. I think this is a pretty easy one. Sometimes people will have one side that feels weaker than another. Sometimes that's just the non-dominant um, hand. Maybe it's because you had a fall and you hurt your shoulder on that side. But a laundry basket can be incredibly heavy. And so this is just a nice way to be able to, to not have to hold the whole weight of the laundry basket. So when might OT be needed? And you're thinking, if some of you are thinking, you know, I don't think I need anything, I'm doing perfectly fine. Um, some of this little webinar part might be just education and knowledge and information. Maybe some of the things that I mentioned would be good for somebody else you know. Everybody's at a different place, right? Some folks have trouble walking and some don't. Some folks have trouble raising their arms over their head and some don't. And so, Certainly at many clinics, if the occupational therapist is available, at some of the visits you may not need um, to talk to an OT because you're stable. Maybe that time you need to talk to a nutritionist or a respiratory therapist instead of an OT or maybe in addition. So many MDA clinics are set up so that you can sort of see who you need. And so the, the times when you might have me checked off, right, that you might want to see me are just new problems that you are having an increased uh, lack of function, perhaps trouble doing a new task or a task that's just making you crazy. For many folks with one girdle, it's not that you cannot do the task. It is that it is fatiguing, it is very slow or time intensive, or it is just difficult all the way around. And sometimes it's just easier to ask for help. I would say, though, if you want to remain independent with the tasks that you have to do, then I can probably make that happen. If it works better to have a caregiver or a spouse or somebody help you, then that's fine, too. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Everybody has their own tolerance for gadgets and, and gizmos and sort of more stuff. But those are some of the things. And it's not just your daily tasks, right? It can be leisure, like this adapted golf cart. This particular gentleman has some balance troubles. And so the seat of his golf cart goes up and forward like a recliner lift chair and allows him to be able to do some golfing without having to worry about tipping over and falling on the ground when, when he golfs. And there are some golf courses that allow you to take the golf cart right up onto the green um, that, that are really committed to folks with varying disabilities. And there are a lot of different sorts of adapted gardening and adapted grooming and adapted bathing, some of the things that we'll talk about that you see in these pictures. Let's go on to the next one since I talked through these a little bit, just so people can see the one that says occupational engagement. You're there, go ahead. All right, perfect. Sorry, everybody, it's always something chaotic when you're talking about technology. So. Occupational engagement, since I explained occupation as being all the things we do, occupational engagement means engaging in your occupations. What do you need to do, want to do, have to do to get through your day? What do you do for fun and work? And how do you sleep and how do you eat and how do you participate in all those things that you need to do? And certainly something like limb girdle um, can be a challenge for fully participating. If we can do the next slide. So occupational therapy at the MDA clinic, as I mentioned verbally at least, is to be able to consider at that clinic when the nurses are triaging and kind of finding out what you want to work on, um, are you having any new problems? Do you have questions? Do you need an adaptation or a trick or a tool? And as I mentioned, a lot of times it's not just that you cannot do something, but something's getting harder, it takes more time, it's more fatiguing, it's more painful, um, it's getting less safe, and all of those things can mean that occupational therapy could help come up with an adaptation. And as I mentioned, we have access to community and other loaner closets, helping to order equipment through insurance, helping to figure out uh, inexpensive and no-cost ideas and then kind of working through ways to stay stretched out, as, as I had mentioned. And let's do the next slide. And then when we would be needed are this list 
of, of things, right? Do you live anywhere close to clinic? And do we need to get you a brace or support or some th ongoing therapy closer to home? We, many MDA clinics are regional. We pull from a pretty wide area, so it allows us to be able to help with those kinds of referrals. And certainly a lack of function, but it doesn't just have to be you're taking care of yourself, like getting dressed and bathed. It can be fun stuff like gardening and like this gentleman who's golfing. This is somebody who might have balance troubles in standing. And so if they can sit on a seat that's elevated and tipped forward, they can still do some golfing, especially with the cart up there in the green uh, and be able to do what they need to do. So the next slide. There is a study I found by Hunter et al. that looked at folks with limb girdle and talked about quality of life and asked them questions and took some quotes and talked with folks about what kinds of things um, they were noticing and what limitations they were having that affected their quality of life. And so the most common things were mobility and ambulation, trouble performing and, and doing activities, um, social role limitations, and emotional distress, such as perhaps not being able to go out with your friends because the distance you have to park away from somewhere is too far to walk, or emotional distress because you're so, so tired of everything being so difficult to have to try to do, right? And so these are just some of those things. And I, don't, I think for anybody um, working their way through this disorder, none of these are necessarily a surprise. But I think you might be surprised to know that occupational therapy could actually help in most of these categories because these are all going to impact the things that you're doing. Now, I might not improve the actual functionality of your heart if you have cardiac issues, but I can certainly help with fatigue management and coming up with tricks and tools to manage things like breathing, shortness of breath, fatigue, those sorts of things that might impact what you're doing. If your sleep is disturbed because you're uncomfortable or because you can't roll as much as you might want to, then I, or you can't get to the bathroom safely in the middle of the night, then that is something that an occupational therapist could certainly help to adapt. Let's do the next one. And this one talks about function for tasks. And it's toileting, bathing, and dressing on this slide. And I tend to do slides that are very, very picture uh, heavy because I do feel like it's fun to be able to take a look at some of the things that I'm trying to describe kind of as we go. So I think most folks have seen that top left picture as a tub bench where you can avoid stepping into the tub. Two feet sit out of the tub. And then you can shove the shower curtain down into that little space um, to keep water from going all over the place. This is a great option. And you can crank the legs up. It is height adjustable. So you can get it pretty decently high. But what if you need it really high to be able to get off of? The picture of that blue chair in the middle of the screen shows an example of an extra high or a hip height shower chair and they make taller benches and, and taller of a number of these kinds where they start off quite tall and go up from there. So these work um, well for tall people, but also folks like those with limb girdle with hip weakness and leg weakness and more difficulty standing from lower surfaces. The top right picture is a toilet uh, lift that has power. It can be put rolled over or kind of moved over almost any toilet and plugs in generally. Some have battery power to be able to go straight up or straight with a slight tip forward up in the air. Now these are not inexpensive, um, but if you're using it, uh, you know, for 10 the next 10 years, it certainly might be worth some fundraising or some investment. The on the right, the the far right side in the middle picture, that's called a toilevator elevator, toilevator, and that guy goes under the whole toilet. You have to unbolt or have someone turn out the water and unbolt the toilet, and then it goes under the toilet, and so you can have a higher handicap height toilet that still might not be enough to get up on your feet. So then you add the toilevator for another three and a half inches, and then maybe a riser on top of the toilet. So then you're practically, you know, your feet are dangling but you don't get stuck on your toilet. 
sometimes when you're baiting, you can be sitting on all these sorts of seats, but then it's quite difficult to get behind your back or get all the way down to your feet. And a long sponge, a long brush might help with that sort of thing. There are some that are bendable. And so when you think about shoulder weakness, if it's just a straight stick, that doesn't really help you get the middle of your back very well. But they do make some that have bendable handles, and that's a really great idea for getting around and kind of curved around your back. I only mentioned grab bars. I think everybody's well aware of grab bars. But sometimes you need one on the outside, right near the shower or tub wall for getting in and out just as much as you need one for inside the shower. Also, there are placements of grab bars that might be ADA, but that's not necessarily the most perfect for you, right? So play around with the placement before anybody drills into your walls. For dressing, there's this gadget called a dressing stick, and that's what the woman with the smile on her face is using down here. And it's simply a dowel rod or a stick with hooks on the end. And it is, I think, one of the least utilized uh, tools that there is, because certainly for shirts, pulling up bras, pushing down shirts in the back, things like that, um, getting shirts over your head, but also it's a great all-purpose push and pull. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about some of those uses a little bit later. The sock aid is on the bottom right picture. And you basically load the sock on this thing up on your lap, and then it has strings. and you sort of throw it down toward your foot, and you sort of slide your foot through that space that has been created with the sock aid and the sock, and so that you're effectively getting your socks on without having to either lift your foot up or bend down. There are lots of ways to avoid shoe tying, lots of new different kinds of shoes in the market and different kinds of shoelaces. So some of the things that I'm mentioning would it, will in no way be applicable to you. But I think, I'm hoping that these slides will start to show the sort of wide range of possibilities um, and it, that it's, it's incredibly difficult to figure out um, a time when there isn't something um, that's potentially available. So let's go on to the next function for tasks. And this one's eating, grooming, and meal prep. And for this one, one of the biggest strategies I have people do who have shoulder weakness and potentially on as it moves down the arm is put your elbows on the table. If your elbows on the table, no, not only can you reach your mouth a little bit easier for eating, you can you could reach your head a little easier for brushing your hair or getting your shirt over your head. You might be able to hold grooming items a little easier, certainly easier than standing at the sink for a lot of folks. And so just being able to do that sometimes gives you enough support. You have breakfast and a whole grooming station with a mirror and a spit cup right there on the table. The second item, the mobile arm support, is the guy in the black shirt on the far right picture on the top. And it's quite a gadget. It uses rubber bands. And basically its purpose is to take away some of the weight of your arm. And so it's really a lovely, lovely option for folks who are trouble, having trouble feeding themselves because of shoulder and elbow weakness even more than hand weakness. And it is something that could attach to the table or to a wheelchair or um, whatever else. And an occupational therapist could help you with that. So there's a lot of gadgets if you're also having some fine motor or gross motor weakness like the, a different kind of pizza cutter. For grooming, they, a lot of people don't realize that the, there are holders for hair dryers that can mount on the wall or stand on the counter so that your energy is being used with the brush or things like, or later just moving your head and not having to hold that relatively heavy hair dryer. You can, as I mentioned, set up the grooming station and certainly just it's something just as easy as an electric toothbrush. Electric shavers, electric toothbrushes, those kinds of things give you a lot more flexibility in your positioning. You could sit down, you could lay back, you could do a lot of different things and not have to work quite so hard to be able to do some of those grooming things. For meal prep, moving around the kitchen, kind of managing those kinds of things, some people have some hand weakness and it's difficulty to open bottles and jars. So some family, when they get home from the grocery store, will pre-open some of the things they might need, or there are certainly lots of rubber and jar opener and bottle opener kinds of options. You can buy things that are already prepped and packaged. One of my favorites is a rolling cart. This one on the bottom right does fold, 
And so a really nice thing about that is you can transport groceries in from the garage. You could get all the items out to make a sandwich and then take it over to a place where you can sit down and rest while you make your sandwich. You can move a laundry basket around in the house. And so a rolling cart is a really, really great all-purpose tool. Some folks, when they cook, really don't trust themselves to get something heavy out of the oven because they might have to bend down, and that isn't really going to be a very good idea. So something lighter weight, like a silicone pan, you can certainly um, sit on a stool in the kitchen. You can think about sliding heavy pots along the counter, those sorts of things. Let's go on to the next slide where I talk about adaptations. And adaptations are looking at different kinds of adaptive techniques and equipments that are a little less for a particular kind of thing, a little more generalized. And so as you're thinking about moving in bed and getting in and out of bed, some people try to go right from laying down to sitting. But what's always going to be easier is if you roll on your side first. So the gentleman in this middle picture who's got that kind of bed cane, he's going to use that something to grab onto that he can roll to his side. And then as you kick your feet off, you can kind of, it helps the weight of your feet falling down, help to lift your upper body up. Now works a lot better than just trying to sort of go from flat lying down on your back to sitting up. You can, you can think about um, getting something like this bed cane. It is a piece under the mattress and then a piece that comes up vertically. It just gives you something to hold on to. But things like reachers and grabbers, you can use things like that to grab just about anything. It won't hold much more than a can of soup, but if you reorganize your kitchen a little bit or your pantry or your laundry, it can certainly help with that. But a grabber, the jaws sometimes aren't strong enough to grab things like um, like a heavy sweater or something that's hung up on the, cl the closet on the rod or to get laundry when it's spun all wet. And so the dressing stick, which is remember is just that stick with a kind of hook on the end, works really nicely for those kinds of heavier things. And then there are, as some of the pictures showed earlier, adapt adaptations for all kinds of leisure. But if you can no longer get on and off the ground and getting out to the backyard is perhaps trickier, go to big pots, go to things on the porch, go to things on to the porch rail, ways that you can still perhaps have a cucumber or a tomato fresh out of your garden or some flowers um, to be able to manage that. Adaptive fishing, there's all kinds of things or golf fishing and garden especially, but lots of other leisure options as well. Let's do the next slide. That's managing surfaces. So many, many people with limb girdle have trouble off of lower surfaces. So some of these are gadgets for that. The top left picture is an item called a super pole. And a super pole uses tension between the ceiling and the floor which means anywhere that just has a regular ceiling, you can put it by the bed, by the toilet, by the tub, by the couch. doesn't make a bit of difference. And they really work great if using your upper body to help um, allows you to be able to help pull yourself up. Some people will make themselves ropes and poles and, and things of other um, sorts to be able to help with that. The risers can be commercially made like under that couch. You can also make the, stack up the couch cushions and things to make it a little taller. You could get a recliner lift chair, but sometimes that isn't quite enough still. So you might need to make your own risers. Like the picture in the sort of middle on the bottom, somebody's taken four by fours and drilled out some holes, you could sort of make them the height that you need as long as you make sure things aren't gonna go sliding around or or whatnot as you go from sitting to standing. Certainly reorganizing, but if you have the opportunity in the kitchen, if you can't reach up, they do make pull-down shelving, which is, which is pretty amazing to be able to reach those things dramatically easier, that's for sure. And then that couch cane at the bottom left is uses the weight of the couch or the chair to hold it steady and just gives you something to pull on, <coughs> excuse me, to help yourself up a little bit. Let's do the next slide that says mobility. So for mobility, that ends up being a moving target for a lot of folks. 
it sometimes is difficult to use a cane or a walker very well. Some people use walking sticks, but some folks need to use a scooter for a longer distance, a manual chair, a power chair, whatever that looks like. What I would suggest is let the OT or PT at the MDA clinic help you figure out what is the best use of your insurance money because any item you get is supposed to last over five years. And that's a long time when you have a progressive disorder. So you have to pick very wisely. The other part of it is, is the seat gonna be tall enough for you to get off of? And so making sure you've got something where the seat can either start a little bit higher or can go up in the air. And so if you get something too basic, like a, a basic little push chair, like a transport chair, something like that, with your insurance money that costs $100, and then you need the $30,000 power chair a couple of years later, you might be having a, a little bit more difficult time. There are also loaners that a lot of times the, the clinic staff either can find for you or understand. And so sometimes it's a matter of your disease is changing, but you don't wanna change what you're using because your whole house, your whole life is set up for that particular mobility device. Let the OT help you reorganize things and to think about different kinds of equipment because sometimes a different power chair means a different way of getting through the doors and a different height of the bed and the toilet and things like that to be able to manage. The second from the bottom bullet where I talked about some things you need to get before the power chair. Some of those things rely in the justification for insurance. It relies on you being able to walk and to move. And the power chair means that you can't walk as well in the justification. So it's hard to do things out of order for a lot of insurances. And again, let the therapy staff at the clinics be able to help you with that. Let's do the next slide. That is transfers. So if sit to stand is harder, certainly doing, um, going from very much taller surfaces. Um, some folks can use the recliner lift chair or you put the recliner lift chair up on risers and then, or a rising platform and then go from there. But if that's not enough, some people will slide or scoop over between surfaces. And if they're close enough, you can sometimes just do that. You may need a board and this bottom right picture is a transfer board to be able to help bridge the gap. It doesn't mean that you always have to slide along it. It just means that maybe you're not 100% sure how the transfer is gonna go and you don't wanna fall between the bed and the chair. It just gives you, or between the chair and the car seat. It just bridges that gap on transfers that might be more difficult. The top two pictures are other kinds of lifts to help with transfers. The top right is called a sit to stand lift. You might be able to tell that there are blocks for the knees and then something that kind of helps you stand and then it's on wheels. This is certainly easier for managing clothing after toileting. It can help a caregiver move you and it lets you get some weight on your feet in a standing position. A lot of people really like these, but most insurances don't like paying for these. What they typically will do is the top left picture, which is that what is often called a Hoyer lift. A Hoyer is just, that name is one of the brands, like Kleenex is a brand of facial tissue. And so this patient lifter uses a sling, that's the blue thing that that person is sitting in. And then this thing's on wheels and it has kind of that arm that lifts you up either with a crank, like a hydraulic crank or with power. Most insurances, of course, pay for the one that's a hydraulic crank, but there may be, you may be able to find access to one through a loaner closet or things like that. And those would, those top two would be for days when you can't trust your standing or you have a caregiver who isn't as strong or one or the other of you hurt your back um, or those kinds of things. It's great to have these things in place before you need them. Good days will take care of themselves. You need to work on the bad days and make sure you have things in place for those days. And the, the therapy staff can certainly help you. Next slide is home and community access. So thinking about your steps, some people can get away with it for a while with using a cane or walker with um, putting up a grab bar or a rail. 
Um, but sometimes it just gets to be too much, and you have to think about some kind of ramp or like the top picture, a porch lift. If you have a whole flight, um, of stairs or you live somewhere that you, your house has to be elevated, you might need something like this porch lift or an elevator or otherwise the ramp is going to circle your house four times because you can't have it too steep and still be able to get up and down it. There are some groups in communities that help build ramps. So talk to the OT um, about being able to, to find places that might be able to help you with that if that's financially out of your reach. There are some churches and some community organizations that can help with that. If you tend to trip because either your hip or knee or ankle won't pick up as much, take a look at the rugs and the obstacles and is it bright enough to be able to see and things like that in your home. That middle picture of that thing that kind of looks like a keychain, it actually plugs into the wall and then the lamp or the light or whatever plugs into it and then it makes your lamp into a remote control. You can keep that remote control someplace where you can have better access to it so that you're not walking to the dark in the, through the dark in the middle of the night to get to the bathroom or things like that. If your doorways are too narrow, you might be able to find a handyman to make those wider but the bottom right picture is called swing clear or offset hinges. The hinges have an extra bend to them and what it effectively does is it gets the width of the door out of the way of the opening of the door. So if you're just almost gonna squeak through the door but it's hard or you just can't quite get through the door, that'll at least give you another couple inches um, and that may be enough. You could also take off the door if you had to. If you have the, the financial means, you could certainly get a, make a, take out the tub, you know, take out a garden tub, make a roll-in, walk-in sort of shower, but that if that is out of reach, the top right picture shows something that spans in a very small bathroom between the toilet and the tub, that seat slides across, or there are some other options for being able to, um, have ways to just use the existing drain from the existing bathtub and just kind of um, get liners and sort of tile the whole darn thing. A bathroom renovation does not have to be $40,000. Um, if you have somebody who can help you deconstruct, and then we actually did this with our house when we bought one in foreclosure and we ended up getting the tile to retile from Habitat for Humanity for very, very low amounts of money. And so it is possible. The, the bidet, I showed that in an earlier picture, but the bidet helps to wash your bottom. You can get them, if you're not worried about warming up the water, you can get a bidet to add to your toilet for $25. That is just something to wash you in the back end if it's hard to reach because of shoulder weakness. If you want something that does warm water or that also dries you off, you may spend a little bit more, 250 to probably 500 but that replaces your toilet seat or goes under your toilet seat and has a little spout that hooks into the clean water for the toilet. Sometimes people are no longer able to drive um, or need adapted driving options. There are occupational therapists that can help do driving evaluations to sort of spend your money wisely and see if that's gonna be able to work to drive perhaps with your arms instead of your legs or that kind of thing. Um, and then other community transportation options to be able to use. On to the next one. So for range of motion pain management, I must mention that OT can help with this, and also physical therapy can as well. But if you have, um, a lot of folks with limb girdle have shoulder and shoulder blade weakness, which means some pain for some folks. Sometimes it's just that you can't reach very far. Um, but sometimes you need to do some things to manage pain, like massage, ice, heat, stretching. The therapy staff at the clinics can give you some options for that. We have we refer people all the time to home and outpatient therapy closer to home, and so they could maybe work on a sore shoulder or hip or that kind of thing. There's a, a tape called kinesio tape. And it basically, um, it goes on the skin. It will stay on for a few days. And it helps to sort of um, help to hold things more stable around the shoulder. So you might get a little more range of motion or at least have a little more ability to move if things aren't sort of uh, moving all over the place as you try to go. So there are just tons of options. If you are still 
moving and crawling very well and you're in early stages, the OT and PT can help you with safe exercise. For some people, their daily routine is enough exercise. And for some people, it really, really, um, they want to stay absolutely as strong as they can so the therapy staff can give you some safe ways to do exercise and to be able to, to manage those kinds of things. All right, for the, let's go on to the next. So OT with high tech. Most folks who don't realize that the more complex power wheelchairs that do things like raise this guy up in this seat or tip people back to get pressure off their bottom or lay them down, those kinds of chairs have Bluetooth built into the joystick of the chair or however the person controls the chair. When you think about that for a second, that means that the Bluetooth in the wheelchair could, that the joystick could act like a wireless mouse for a computer. It could help control a tablet or a phone. It could help control um, things like Alexa and Google Home that you might have set up through Bluetooth. And so thinking about talking to the people who help with your wheelchair, if you have one and have the need to be able to use Bluetooth, you can set up some things through your power chair. But certainly if using any kind of scooter or wheelchair, sometimes just getting the door open and getting out of the way, getting the door shut, getting it unlocked before the person who was at the door leaves, um, and kind of getting in and out in case of an emergency, all those things are very important. And so sometimes you can get power doors. You can get um, where you can tell Alexa or Google Home to lock or unlock the door. And certainly taking a look at some of that kind of technology really might be worth it. It is not as expensive as you might think. And once things are set up, you do not necessarily have to have Wi-Fi to keep it going. If it's just things that you're doing, like turning on and off lights and opening doors within your own home, Many times you don't have to have the Wi-Fi. Um, even if you just want to see who's at the front door, you can literally stick a tablet. Its only function is just to show you who's at the front door with a ring, things like that. Okay? Let's go on to the next one. Thinking about energy savers. Okay? I just talked about power door openers, and usually there's some kind of switch or button that helps you get the door open. We did have a client a few years ago that had a fire in the house and he would not have gotten, been able to get out with his life if a neighbor wasn't walking by because he got his scooter kind of stuck near the door and was blocking the door effectively. And he had unlocked it so the guy was able to kind of ram his way in and pull him out before he burned up. But being able to get in and out of your home, even if you have steps and you have to throw yourself out in the yard, at least you can get out if you need to. Thinking about ways to save energy when you're doing some of your home chores. Could you get a vacuum that moves itself or is very lightweight? Could you get um, something that gives you more reach? You can get long, long, long handle toilet brushes and things for dusting and all for, you know, those sorts of things that are also pretty lightweight. This top picture looks like a shower chair, but it's actually a kitchen stool. And so the kitchen stool um, is a great, great option, along with the rolling cart, to be able to sit at the stovetop and cook, to be able to sit at the counter and to be able to chop and prep, to be able to take a break for a minute because a lot of times fatigue is about sort of things building up through the whole day and a lot of small energy expenditures more than it is about any particular one thing that completely wears you out a lot of the time. Some people need to consider their week and how they can do things differently. Maybe they need to clean for 15 minutes a day instead of doing the whole house on Saturday. Maybe for all those people in their life that say, just let me know what I can do, everybody puts in 10 bucks a month or five bucks a month, all those people, and you get a cleaning person, right? And maybe there are some very small things. Maybe you have friends who like to clean. I don't know those people, but, you know, maybe you do. And so there can be some options that 
that could work out um, the same energy without ha having to be such a big deal. Let's do the next slide. This one is just sort of a kind of overall thing to think about. Here, the bottom picture is that stool in action. There is no reason why it couldn't go by a go near a sink. If you have cabinet doors under your kitchen or under your bathroom sink, just open the doors. You may have to take out a shelf or take out a little bit of stuff, but let your knees go into the space under the, the shelf, uh, under the sink, because the doors are open, or you can even take the doors off, just so you can get a little bit closer if you don't have the money for to raise a sink or have an adaptation. The top left picture is actually a portable shower. These are a super great idea if you don't have the space or the money or the ability, maybe you rent, to be able to deal with the bathroom. Maybe you can't even get in the bathroom door. This guy can um, go anywhere that you have access to a water supply. Uh, it could technically go on the porch, but that water is going to be pretty cold if it's an outside spigot. So what a lot of people do is they will set it up in the kitchen or the garage or honestly even the living room. The front folds down and then you walk in, roll in, put any kind of seat in there that you want to. You, it's hooked in with the water supply and then there's a pump down at the bottom. Once you fold the bottom back up and it makes a little pool of sorts, there's a pump that, that pulls that water back to the sink. It doesn't have to be right, right next to the water, it just needs to have access to the water. So you can make this work for somewhere in the $1,500 range. Um, but honestly, if you did this with PVC and shower curtains and tarps and a pool, an old used pool pump, I don't know, you might be able to figure something out to be able to, to make this kind of thing work. And so a lot of the function, the focus for OT is about function. What are you having problems with? What do you need us to adapt? And what do you need us to do? You, some MDA clinics will have access to staff in between MDA clinics. So when you can always call back or send a message back to the clinic and the doctor or the nurse staff there can, can get answers for you for some of these kinds of things. Some of them aren't a particularly big deal, but you could ask when you're at clinic, or you could ask for an occupational therapy referral for home health or outpatient therapy for when you leave the clinic, even just for one session or two sessions to kind of get a little bit of a tune-up. A lot of folks with limb girdle will do sort of short periods of therapy for when they have a slight change in strength that means that they're perhaps less safe or they are having more balance trouble or whatever, the OT or even PT, whoever can come in and, and does some, some work on adapting a whole bunch of different things, giving you some options for equipment, giving you some tricks and tools, and then they go away. And then you don't maybe have them again for a few years until you have another change or things kind of are adding up that are meaning that you're needing to do something different. The, a lot of people don't realize that the power wheelchairs, like the one in the top picture that can really change your position, anytime you're having enough trouble going from sitting to standing that you cannot do that at all, or you cannot do that by yourself, you really need to think about a chair that helps you change your position. And for a lot of people, these seem really big. I will say that when you take out your measuring tape, they're often fairly um, similar width-wise and sometimes even length-wise to a lot of the more basic power chairs. They just look bigger because they have a lot more motor and a lot more brains and a lot more power underneath them so they can tip a person over, right? But they aren't actually, as far as a footprint in your home, that much bigger. And so really consider your pressure relief in the skin on your bottom and your back and being able to maintain that long term. It can be really tricky for a lot of people. For some folks, um, having a gadget is the best thing ever because it means they can stay independent with what they want to do. For others, the gadget is about the worst thing that they can imagine 
because it feels like they're having to give up the way that they like to do a certain thing. And so everybody has to come to their own place about gadgets and tricks and tools. And so if the frustration of the task is more than the frustration of the gadget, then maybe you seek out the OT. For something as simple as this jar opener, you, there are tools to do that, or you can hand it to somebody in your family, right? And whatever that looks like for you um, can, certainly, can certainly work fine. So just keeping a thought about occupation and that there is really a trick or tool for just about anything you might want to do. And so I suspect I've been moving really fast in this presentation because we, we had a little bit of that time lag. And so I suspect I probably have raised more questions than I have actually given you answers. Because many times after a presentation like this, I'll have a question such as, but can there, can this or something to do this or something to do that? And so what I always encourage you is if you either ask for OT at the MDA clinic or you ask for outpatient or home health OT so that you can get the answers to some of that, or I'm about wrapped up, I'll answer them for you hopefully in a couple minutes. But a lot of times, um, community loaner closets, things you can borrow, things that you can try, um, and things that are cheap and easy. Um, I have some folks with hand weakness, and they have trouble with Ziploc bags and packaging. And so a little, little needle dolls pliers will get things like that open, but you may already have it in the toolbox. So I really enjoy doing things like that for little to no money. Let's do the last slide. And so here's my contact information. I do work full time at the clinic in Charlotte. And so I do have some availability and I enjoy talking with people and answering questions. So it's not a bother. If you want to reach out, you can. And we have a couple minutes. And Michelle, I guess if you'll just repeat any questions that are coming in, I'll be happy to do my best. Yes, thank you, Amber. And thank you for calling us back and uh, finishing the presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, oh, I'm so sorry that it went awry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, technical difficulties happen. I saw a few people in the chat raise their hands. Our audio is muted uh, today. So if you have a question, if you want to chat it or put it in the Q&A. One has come in already. Um, this audience member has two questions. The first one is, I'm concerned about stretching or increasing joint range of motion because I use my mm. tightness as a fulcrum to make transfers. How can I mm. passively stretch without losing other functions? That's a super good question. Let me do that one first before we, okay. before we do the next one. Um, it is true that some people have kind of evolved with their transfers to use that tightness. Others, the tightness limits them. So it may have to be a case-by-case -case basis, um, or if there are some joints, let's say elbow or wrist or fingers or whatever, or neck even, that is not as important for transfers or whatever, then maybe those are the ones that you stretch. But some people, if they get too tight, it really leads to pain and discomfort. And so it is everything with this disease is a, is a very delicate balance. And so you're right, I really should have talked a little bit about that as well. I would say it's maybe a little less common um, that people do, um, but whatever works for you, that's for sure, whatever keeps you safe. Thank you. Uh, the second question was, have you ever seen a, cha a shower chair that is powered? Is that safe? <laughs> so they make the power toilet ones. I have not seen a power shower seat that will go straight up. You know, I would bet there's probably lots of rules in the, in the book uh, for the power toilet about not getting things wet and whatnot. Um, you know, I don't think that's probably why. It's just the worry about, about electrocuting yourself and whatnot. Yes. But there are some toilet seats that use hydraulic, and it may be that that sort, because it's an air compression, would be, could work in a more open shower stall. 
um, and that might be worth looking into. Um, thank you. A question came in, um, issues with buttoning shirts, any suggestions? Mm, absolutely. So there is a gadget called a button hook that does great with shirts. The, the issue is, is in, many times when you have trouble with shirts, you have trouble with pants and all the other things. And so you have this great button hook at home, but that doesn't help you out at the grocery store when you need to use the restroom and you're stuck in your pants. And so what I strongly encourage people to do is to have someone who sews or an alterations person take off the button, put it on the front so it looks like it's through the hole, and behind it put a sew-in magnet or a little piece of Velcro. The cell and magnets are about the size of a small button, then they work great because the Velcro some can sometimes get a little yucky in the washing machine and gets a little curled and whatnot. So the cell and magnets I've been finding on Amazon and they are awesome. If one other little caveat, if you have jeans with that big kind of metal rivet button, there's a tool that can take that off, but usually Places like a shoe repair or an alterations place will, can take that big metal button off, or if you have, you know, button fly, and then just replace it with a blue or black button on the front, and then again, the magnets or the Velcro um, in behind. If you have trouble with a zipper, most zippers have a hole in the end, so you can put a loop of fishing line or an empty key ring or something in there, so you can just kind of hook your finger around your zipper, and you can get a little better hold of it. Thank you, Amber. And for our attendees, our uh, behind the scenes tech has added some Amazon lists to button hooks and also sew in magnets. So uh, Yay, thank you. She, yeah, <laughs> she, added, she added those in the chat. So, uh, another question, where do you find the tall sh shower chairs? The tall shower chairs? I'm sorry. Yes, the tall sh shower okay. chairs. So they, if you're searching on Google or whatever, start with HIP, H-I-P, HIP height shower chairs. And if you're uh, behind the scenes, you can probably find that. Um, you can also look for sort of extra tall shower chairs, extra tall stools, extra tall kitchen stools, those sorts of words to be able to get something a little bit taller. But many times the hip height chairs are meant for people who have had hip replacements and they're not allowed to sit on lower chairs. But they work awesome for people who have some more trouble getting up on their feet. I've even had people take those height chairs and then add their own risers onto the bottom of them carefully so things aren't gonna slide around of course, but to make them even taller yet. Awesome. And once again, our MDA guru has added a hip height stool on Amazon in the chat. So if anybody was interested in picking it up on Amazon, we have added it to the chat. One other little note about shower seats. You can get a shower seat that you can, that hangs on the wall, like what that sort of bolts into the wall um, that is height adjustable. So the seat is sort of a fold down seat and it effectively has whatever height range you want because you install it wherever you want. And so um, that could be enough to almost just sort of perch on a little bit if it's really quite difficult to stand up. A tip came in from uh, attendee that's, that says that the grabbers for picking up pine cones from the hardware store are stronger than typical grabbers. Hey, hey, great, that's awesome. The challenge is, is the more sturdy the grabber, the heavier it is many times, and sometimes right. people need what are called featherweight or very light, so it's a trade-off, right? Um, just kind of figure out, you may have one for different uses or depending how strong your shoulders are, or whatever. Uh, another question has come in. I need things to be really high up, really high to get up, and was wondering how high the power toilets go and do they work with a bidet? So there is um, only one company that I've seen, and I don't know much, I don't know good or bad, I just know the name of this company. It was called, I think, I believe it's called Dignity Lifts or Dignity Toilets. 
but they their power toilet they've added a bidet seat to it that's the only one that i know of and the challenge with the bidet seat it is it is your toilet seat but then you add on this power riser and it becomes your toilet seat and you can't really use a standard bidet anymore and so the one that has the the bidet attached to it is a great idea if i believe it's dignity lifts uh but I'm, I'm not at work, so I don't have it, that email right with me. Um, another option, um, every lift goes up a different height, so I can't, I don't know what the sort of top height for those are. I do know you're going to want one that goes up more than it goes forward. Some of them just sort of launch you forward and you'll never get your knees underneath you if it doesn't go straight up first. Thank you. And uh, once again, our MDA tech has added a list of community loan closets for each state and has also added a stand aid power toilet lift uh, website. Yeah, that's the one. That one doesn't, I don't think has the bidet as part of it, but that's a great list. Yep. She also found the dignity lift and added it to the chat as well. Awesome. Yeah, she is on. If you're hunting for these sorts of things and can't find them, you can always email me. I might have found them for somebody else. Absolutely. And you can also, if um, Amber is not available, reach out to our MDA Resource Center um, and get these uh, resources as well. One last question has come in. Uh, what about mm -hmm. fishing gadgets or fishing poles? Okay, absolutely. So I did put one picture of uh, that kind of harness that holds the fishing pole on one of the slides but if you search like in google or whatever for adapted fishing or fishing comma disability or things like that you will find so many websites that um, are just for fishermen or for have all kinds of recreation equipment so there are power casters there are power reelers there are ways to hold the um the rods in different ways. There are a lot of great options out there. I am not a fisher person, and so I don't have a ton of experience with them, but I've certainly recommended them to a lot of people that do enjoy that. Thank you, Amber, and thank you so much for including in your presentation not just uh, equipment for activities of daily living, but also including some equipment to have some fun. Um, no other questions have come in, so we will conclude your presentation. Amber, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we appreciate everything you do for the neuromuscular community, so thank you so much. Absolutely my pleasure. Have a good day, everybody.